When inspiration hits, you want to be ready. For me, it's often in the shower, and I have one of those dorky waterproof notepads and a pencil in there, just in case. But for real geniuses, you hope they're doing something extraordinary in a magnificent setting, surrounded by brilliance. I always think I should think of some romantic story of sitting underneath an apple tree or sitting on the edge of Haleakala Crater on Hawaii at sunrise or something. Meet Frank Drake, an astronomer and astrophysicist, and a founding father of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. He's a legendary figure, but his most famous idea did not come to him in one of those magnificent settings. No, the birth of his most famous equation came about while Frank was planning a conference. Although, to be fair, it was the first serious scientific conference on the search for aliens, which is still pretty cool. He invited everyone in the world who had something to contribute to this subject. All 12 of them. (laughs) And they all showed up to Frank's conference at the -the state-of-the-art headquarters of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Greenbank, West Virginia. There were some important people. That was the first time I met Carl Sagan, for example. Uh, One of the members of the group was Melvin Calvin, who was the one who deciphered the way chlorophyll works, and probably going to get the Nobel Prize for that. Uh, Bernard Oliver, who was one of the main brains in Silicon Valley's development. And if you're going to host a conference with the who's who of the science world, you might want to come up with an agenda. So that's what Frank did. And so the night before the meeting, I decided, well, we can't just all go sit down in a room and start start talking. What is it we need to know about to uh, understand how many civilizations there might be in space? So I thought that through, and I realized, well, you, you need to know how many Earths there are and how often life appears and how often life uh, evolves intelligence how often intelligence creates a technology we can detect. I realized, well, if we knew the probabilities of all those and multiply them together, plus knowing how long a civilization remained detectable, we would have an answer for how many things there are out there we might find when we search. Well, that's the, that's the equation. The equation, or as everyone calls it, the Drake equation the one that every astronomer, every space hobbyist, every sci-fi geek knows and can probably recite by heart. There have been occasions when I've been still sleepy or something, I forget. And 10-year-old kids, a lot of them know it better than I know it. They'll recite it to me. You can forgive Frank Drake for forgetting from time to time. The 90-year-old radio astronomer has been chewing on these ideas since at least the 1950s, Despite the decades, the Drake equation remains central to alien seekers everywhere. N equals R star times F sub P times N sub E times F sub L times F sub I times F sub C times capital L. So yeah, it doesn't trip off the tongue quite as easily as, say, E equals MC squared, but it's still pretty elegant. And it helps us get a handle on the likelihood of intelligent alien life and the chances of actually communicating with them. I'm Laura Krantz, and this is Wild Thing, Space Invaders, a series about the search for extraterrestrial life, where we're looking, what we're looking for, and why we hope we're not alone. If you're not familiar with the Drake Equation, or you know it only by name, and full disclosure, that was me up until about a year ago, let's walk through it. Basically, Frank Drake was trying to figure out all the elements that life would need to form, and then evolve into something that's technologically advanced enough that we could find it out there in the vastness of space. On one side of the equation, we have N. The equation gives M, which is the number of detectable civilizations. It's not the number of civilizations, but detectable ones. Basically, N is the number of civilizations in our galaxy that we could communicate with. And it's equal to everything on the other side of that equation. A simple 
chain of probabilities. The equation consists of taking the rate of star formation, how many stars are born each year. R star, you take that and multiply it by the fraction of those stars that have planets orbiting them, F sub P, and then multiply that by the average number of those planets that develop an ecosystem, N sub E. You multiply that by the fraction of those that actually give rise to life. F sub L. I know, this is a lot of multiplication. We're almost there, I swear. You multiply that by the fraction of systems of living things which become intelligent. F sub I. And you multiply by the fraction of the intelligent civilizations that create a technology we can detect. F sub C. This is the fraction of alien civilizations that have tech we can actually see, hear, or find. Like radio signals, Morse code, alien megastructures, whatever. Then you multiply one last time by capital L, which is the average amount of time that these civilizations remain detectable. And there we make an assumption that they don't remain detectable always. They are either terminated by some horrible accident or asteroid hit, or more likely because their technology becomes so sophisticated that we can't detect it. Which, he says, is the way our planet is going right now. We used to use antennas to transmit everything. Now we use cables. Our satellite transmissions have become way more efficient, which means a lot fewer of those transmissions escape out into space. As we are going now, within 100 years, Earth is going to disappear. We will still be there. And we'll be doing really well, and we'll have rich sources of information and entertainment and such. But Earth will be very hard to detect. Frank seems visibly disappointed by this trend. He spent a good portion of his life looking for those kinds of signals out there in space. That's how he and many others hope we'll find extraterrestrial intelligence. But if we're becoming less noticeable... Chances are our extraterrestrial counterparts are too. And I think that's going to happen everywhere, which is too bad, actually. I don't like that. (laughs) That's against my wishes. (laughs) So that's why the, the most important factor in the equation is the last one, which is the, it's always written with a large L, the longevity of civilizations in a detectable state. In our case... That period of longevity only stretches about 90 years from when we put out those very first radio signals back in the 1930s. Now, our civilization is pretty young in the grand scheme of things. The universe is 15 billion years old. We are uh, on a star that's only 4 billion years old, so that most of the stars are older than we are, which means the civilizations from those stars are older than ours. And it means that almost all the civilizations we detect will be older than we are. Chances are, then, their technology will also be much further along, making them less obvious and likely much harder to find. We've only been looking for alien radio signals since the 1960s. If another identical Earth existed a few hundred light years away, but 500 years older... Their technology may be so much further along that we would have no way of picking up their signals. So we're working with a limited window of time. But here's the upside, and this is the heart of the Drake Equation. Data from the Kepler Space Telescope showed that there could be as many as 40 billion Earth-sized planets orbiting in the habitable zones of stars within the Milky Way galaxy. We don't know how many of those planets might actually hold life, let alone intelligent life with technology. But 40 billion potentially habitable planets is a lot of planets. So even if the odds of intelligent life are really low, the sheer number of places where it could be should make up for those low odds. Pausing for a moment here to ask for your help. A podcast like Wild Thing is not easy to put together, and it takes a lot of time and effort. And if you'd like to show your support, consider becoming a premium subscriber. You'll get new episodes early, plus exclusive access to the bonus episodes from all three seasons. Not to mention the warm, fuzzy feeling that comes from backing something you love. 
If you're intrigued, go to wildthingpodcast.com to find out how to become a premium subscriber. That's Wild Thing Podcast, all one word. And thanks for your support. Here's the thing about the Drake equation. It's really less of an equation in the sense of hard numbers and more of a thought experiment. The number of detectable civilizations equals the total of a bunch of different factors. Astrophysical ones, like the rate of star formation. Biological ones, like the fraction of planets that develop life. And sociological ones, like the average length a civilization will survive. When people first started talking about the Drake equation 60 years ago, they simply had to make educated guesses about most of the variables. But we've learned a lot since then, especially about the astrophysical questions, like how many planets could be habitable. And, as we heard in the last episode, we're making a little progress on understanding some of the biological questions, like how life originates and the conditions it needs. The sociological factors? Well, that's still straight-up guesswork. We really have no idea how long technological civilizations stick around, although I guess our own civilization is sort of an experiment in its own right. If we blow ourselves up in a hundred years or so, then we'll at least have one time span to make predictions on. In any case, until we have more specific information, we've got some ideas for what to look for. Back when Frank Drake started sketching out his equation, many scientists used radio waves to learn about space. Having last taken physics in high school, I'd kind of forgotten what radio waves were and had to do a little refresher. You might think of radio in terms of sound, like listening to Top 40 or NPR on the drive home from work. But radio isn't sound, it's actually a kind of light. And what's happening is your car stereo is taking that light and turning it into sound through the electronics in the box. So this means to understand radio, we need to understand light. Here we go. Radio is a kind of light in the same way that visible light, the way that you and I are seeing each other right now, is a kind of light. And there are other kinds of light, infrared, ultraviolet, x-rays, microwave, These are all different kinds of light, and radio is just one kind of light. I'm bringing David Brain back to do the physics. He's the planetary scientist from the University of Colorado Boulder. And if you think about light having properties of a wave, then radio has a wavelength associated with it. And that wavelength for radio is large. It's all the way at one end of the whole array of choices of kinds of light. And that array of choices of kinds of light we call the electromagnetic spectrum. Astronomers use various parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, all these different kinds of light, for different things. But all light travels at the same speed, a rip-roaring 186,282 miles per second. And almost everything emits some sort of light. You, me, the sidewalk, Plants, maybe Bigfoot, anything with a temperature, which, like radio, is a word with a very specific meaning in physics. So temperature is a measure of how much um, particles are rattling around and shaking around. And so anything that is at a temperature of absolute zero will not emit light. At absolute zero, the particles that make up different objects and gases and liquids do not move at all which means they have no temperature, and they're not emitting any light. But for all the rest of us, anything is emitting light. Anything in this room, uh, anything in space that you can see, well, by definition, has to be emitting light. But this table, your microphone, the pen over here, uh, the butterfly that's flying past, they're all emitting light. You know, that temperature is a measure of how much you're rattling around. The more you rattle around, you might expect to, to be giving off more energy. And that's what light is. Light is energy. The hotter you are, the more light you give off at every single wavelength. So the hotter you are, the shorter the wavelength of light you give off. The cooler you are, the longer the wavelength of light. So now we already know that our sun emits most of its light in, at visible wavelengths. We can see it. Um, And our sun is thousands of degrees, maybe 5,000 degrees, uh, that it's emitting light. But you and I are not 5,000 degrees. I mean, we're hot, but we're not that hot. So the light we emit has a lower frequency 
and a longer wavelength. So you and I emit light in the infrared instead of in the visible. And heat vision goggles, everybody calls it heat vision. That's a cool name. They're really goggles that are sensitive to infrared light and can see the light that our bodies are emitting or this pen or this microphone or the butterfly. It turns out planets and people and animals are all cool enough that they tend to have most of their light emitted in the infrared. But some planets and other space phenomena are even cooler than we are, and they emit light in the radio part of the spectrum, which is where radio astronomers do their work. Traditionally, radio astronomy looks at various celestial bodies. But radio astronomy, which really developed just before the Second World War, uh, allows you to see the natural radio signals that are produced in space. Seth Shostak is the author of Confessions of an Alien Hunter and the senior astronomer at the SETI Institute. We're talking about things like quasars and pulsars and hot gas and cold gas. And it turns out all these things, some of them make light. You know, stars make light. They don't make too much radio. But other things maybe don't make too much light, but they make a lot of radio waves. He's talking about things that give off light in the radio part of the spectrum, as opposed to in the visible part of the spectrum. And by studying those things, you can learn things about the universe, very interesting things. You would not learn much about Earth, though, at least if you went looking for these naturally occurring radio waves. Well, if you look for Earth, it's hard to find Earth, actually, but it does produce some radio waves, which, if you could hear them, would sound, you know, that sort of thing. But you'd have to be pretty close to pick that up with any reasonable setup because, you know, the Earth doesn't produce an enormous amount of radio waves. However, in the case of the Earth, there's another kind of radio wave coming off the Earth, namely radar, television, FM radio. All that's leaking right off the Earth. So that would be a little more interesting. And those radio waves go zipping off into space at the speed of light. Because, remember, radio is a type of light. So we're looking for these same types of radio light waves coming from other places, extraterrestrial places. Signs of what the Drake Equation calls intelligent life that's developed interstellar communication. In comparison with the radio waves that naturally come off a pulsar or a quasar, this would be something that has a pattern or some sort of signal that makes it, well, unnatural. Of course, we're working under the assumption that alien civilizations are using, or at least used, similar technology. Absolutely no guarantee of that. She's right. So we're looking out there to see if we can find any radio signals, any optical signals, anything that might indicate megastructures, geoengineering, that kind of thing that would tell us that someone else is using a technology. Meet Jill Tarter. You might have heard her name before. She's kind of a big deal. She helped pioneer the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and the main character in the movie Contact is based on her. This is a unique time in our history, in the history of any civilization. It's uh, the moment of the acquisition of technology. That's the moment where contact becomes possible. She knows alien civilizations might have totally different tech. But, like the search for life, you start with what you know. We can do what we know, and we can postulate that an advanced technological civilization might be doing some of the same things, kind of on steroids, that we do. Uh, We think about what a civilization needs. They need energy for all kinds of reasons. They need transportation, and you try and think of what might be the consequences of these various actions, and then you go look for them. So SETI scientists like Jill and Seth try to think of what alien civilizations might need, what they might be doing, and what locations seem most likely. They build their search around those ideas and direct their radio telescopes to monitor those parts of the sky. Those telescopes receive radio waves from space, and that information gets converted by computers into data we can study. We decided that looking for signals that were obviously engineered as opposed to astrophysical. In the radio, what we would look for as a signpost is compression and frequency, a narrow signal that shows up at just sort of one channel on the radio dial. You're looking for the kind of signal that would say, hey, there's a transmitter here. 
Finding that signal is challenging. For one, we don't know which frequency to listen to. There are literally billions and billions and billions of possible frequencies. And, of course, since we haven't heard from the aliens and they don't know our email addresses, uh, we don't know what, what frequency to tune in. So we have receivers that step up the dial that cover as many frequencies as they can. In the beginning, they could only listen to one frequency at a time. A year later, the technology improved enough that they could observe 1,000. And it's continued to improve by leaps and bounds. Now there are new projects in the works that can observe millions of frequencies. We'll hear about it in a later episode. But, as Seth said, there are billions of frequencies. You also have to hope that your radio telescopes are pointed in the right direction when and if a signal comes by. We're looking for that needle in a haystack. It could be like this. Brilliant goal! Rose Lavelle might have won the World Cup for the United States! Or like this. And signals from other planets, other civilizations, other species, even if they do exist, can only travel as fast as the speed of light will allow. By the time they reach us, or we find them, the civilization that created them may be long gone. And Frank Drake factored this problem into his equation. He knew it presented a pretty significant challenge. Because space is big. Unfathomably big. A lot of times people don't realize that space is probably... Uh, one of the things that has the most fitting name because space is basically space. That's what we have the most, space and nothingness in between things. Meet Jorge Perez Gallegos. He's an astronomer. He's a lot of other things too, a designer, a professor, but his background is in astronomy, specifically galaxy formation and evolution over cosmological timescales, meaning he thinks about enormous distances over <clears throat> an astronomically long time. A lot of times people don't really stop and think about what we mean when we say things are huge, are really far away. We are so influenced by uh, popular media and science fiction, you know, and all of a sudden we are in the Millennium Falcon traveling at the speed of light so we can go from one planet in a star system to another planet in another star system and it seems that it's just been a few seconds and, and you know, those things are clearly way out of reach. To help us get a better grasp of distances, Jorge has offered a guided tour through the scale model of the solar system on the University of Colorado Boulder's campus. And we're basically in a very, very, very hot spot because we are right next to the sun. Not literally. It's actually a damp and drizzly gray day. Students pass by on their way to class, and cars slosh through puddles in the parking lot. We're standing at the start of our journey at the Fisk Planetarium, near a black granite pedestal topped by a golden sphere, the sun and a plaque with this inscription. The model solar system depicts the sun and its nine planets to scale one to 10 billion. In the apex of the pyramid is the sun. Along the walkway to the north, black pedestals display the planets and their innermost moons. Be careful, every step you take represents millions of kilometers. Now's my chance to move faster than the Millennium Falcon, at scale at least. At that scale, the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, would be the size of a cherry at the distance of the Panama Canal, 3,990 kilometers from Boulder. This scale model was created in the 1980s, in memory of the astronauts killed in the 1986 Challenger explosion, a reminder of the dangers of space travel. You'll note that Jorge said nine planets when he read that plaque, which I remember as my very excellent mother just served us nine pizzas. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. Pluto, sadly, has been demoted to a dwarf planet, but at least it's still on this model. So now it's my very excellent mother just served us nachos? So you don't need the nine and the the pizzas are gone, (laughs) you know? So, yeah, nachos it is. Fine. 
but out of nostalgia, we're still going to visit Pluto. So we're going to go for a walk. Yes. Apparently every step we take is millions of kilometers. Correct. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. We are at Mercury. So we took seven steps and we went approximately so, 57,900,000 kilometers. There you have it. And it took us, what, three seconds to walk here? Yeah, not much. <laughs> so let's go to Venus. One, two, See? three, four, five, six. So we are in Venus. It's, uh, yeah, about uh, 108 million kilometers to the sun. It's very similar in size to the Earth. And actually, there was a recent study that says that Venus may have been able to be habitable earlier in the, in the age of the solar system and for longer than we had previously thought. And that's fascinating because it helps us understand better what the necessary ingredients for life are. So let's go to Earth. All right, here we go. So we are now on Earth, uh, made a statement. <laughs> <laughs> Just over 94 million miles from the sun. For, for you to have an idea, the light from the sun takes eight minutes to reach the Earth. So that means that the sun is like eight light minutes away. If I was able to build a switch that would work with the sun and I switch off the sun, it would take for us, well, it would take eight minutes for us to realize that the sun is gone. The further out we go, the longer that delay becomes, which means when we look at the sky, we're always looking at the past. And this becomes more uh, uh, obvious when you are talking astronomy, because like you're acknowledging that every light that you're collecting, it's taking time to get to you. But even when I look at you and when you look at me, you are seeing the past. Because we might be two feet away, but light is actually traveling those two feet. So it's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second, but there's always a little delay with the reality that we interact with. Most of the people I talk to who think intelligent alien civilizations exist don't believe they're in our solar system. They'd be way farther away which makes communication a serious test of patience. You know, it's like having a conversation of like, hello, how are you doing? Hello, how are you doing? Hello, how are you doing? Let's assume it's Proxima Centauri. Like, eight years later, yeah, we're fine, what about you? We're fine, we're fine, we're fine. You can start to get a sense for why. If we're looking for signs of extraterrestrial intelligence, it could be a real pain in the butt. As for visiting them, that will be much, much harder. And this is actually the orbit of the moon to scale. This is how far humans have traveled. It's four centimeters away uh, at this scale. That's how much we've actually traveled in space. Four centimeters, a little over an inch and a half. In real distances, that's 238,900 miles. So we have a ways to go. We have, like, ways and ways to go. And then the other interesting thing is this is the only planet that we've known that has ever hosted life. This is the only one that we know. Where we've lingered on Earth long enough. Yes. It's time to move on to Let, our next planet. Let's go to Mars. Everyone's favorite planet. And, and it looks that we might have a human mission to the red planet within the next like 15, 20 years, which would be like outstanding. Imagine the significance of making it to the moon for the entire world. So imagine now the significance of making it not to our own satellite, but making it to another planet in our planetary system. All of a sudden we would be an interplanetary species. It's expected to take us six to nine months to get to Mars, which on average is about 140 million miles away from Earth. But on this model, it's only about 10 feet, and the sun is a little over 50 feet behind us. With that in mind, we leave Mars and continue our outbound journey. 
past Jupiter, the largest planet in the solar system, 778 million kilometers from the sun. One of Jupiter's moons, Europa, is a potential candidate for hosting microbial life because it looks like it has water on it. Then on to Saturn, which also has a candidate moon, Enceladus. And from there, we head to Uranus. Uranus? I don't know how it's, I think, I feel like it's pronounced. I mean, it depends on, it depends on, on who you're talking to. Like when I go to public schools, like with little kids, like, cause they get very like, oh, Uranus, Uranus. It's their favorite planet to pronounce. Yeah. <laughs> it's my least favorite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For, I guess like it changes. Like when you're a kid, you, you like it cause it's funny. And then eventually it's like, no, I don't want to say it. <laughs> right now, if you were to look back, we no longer have access to the sun from here, from this view, we're far away. We are like now like two billion, like almost three billion kilometers away from the sun. Looking back, even if the campus buildings weren't in the way, our starting point, the sun, is just a teensy tiny twinkle. But no rest for the weary. We're continuing on to Neptune. We made it to Neptune. 4.5 billion of kilometers away from our starting point. Less than half a kilometer, or a little over a quarter of a mile on this model. You know, as we've kept walking, go back and think about those four centimeters between the Earth and the Moon, and realize that that's how far we've gone. Like, humans have not been farther away than, than the Moon. And the solar system, just the solar system, is huge. Yeah. So when you start thinking about the possibility or feasibility of even going farther away, and, and then not only that, it's like, it's as challenging for us as it might be to any other potential live being that might be out there. Yeah. So at the end of the day, distances are one of the key challenges for life to find a counterpart. Right, so technically this is our last planet. Technically this is our last planet. Uh, for those that are nostalgic, there will still be another one. Oh, Pluto. It's just another world that could play a role in explaining how feasible or, or possible life might be um, in those little rocks that orbit stars all over the galaxy. And there are a lot of them. If we keep going beyond Pluto... Asteroids and comets and the Oort cloud. And then if we keep going, eventually we leave the solar system. And eventually if we were to keep going and keep going and keep going at the speed of light, we would get to Proxima Centauri, which is the closest star to the sun. And then we could keep going and then finding more and more and more stars. And eventually, if we were to travel for millions and millions and millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, we would make it out of the spiral galaxy, the Milky Way. We would look back and we would see like the spiral arms and we would say bye-bye to our galaxy. And then I look into the void of a space and I see many, 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 many millions and billions of other galaxies. A lot of potential out there just as the Drake equation suggests. But man, this walk just emphasizes how those distances and the time it takes to cross them, even at the speed of light, make finding extraterrestrial civilizations all the more difficult. All total, the walk from the sun to Pluto was just over a third of a mile and took roughly seven minutes. That's one ten billionth of the distance we'd have to cover to actually get there. Any intelligent extraterrestrial civilization is likely far beyond that. So what are the chances we'll actually meet them? So the issue may not be, is there life elsewhere? The issue may be, given the distances between the places in which life could happen, would two different life forms from different planets in different galaxies be ever able to to be aware of each other. It doesn't seem likely, does it? And yet, think about all the factors in the Drake equation. We know that there are lots of stars with planets, and we know the number of planets that could be habitable are in the tens of billions. 
I have a hard time believing that there's not something out there. Because when you start talking about billions, even remote chances are huge. Even if the distances between us seem almost insurmountable. So scientists and explorers and dreamers definitely shouldn't give up. But patience will be a virtue in this field. Based on what I've heard so far, it sounds pretty unlikely that we'll be talking to aliens, let alone shaking hands with them anytime soon. But let's think about Oumuamua for a second here. Let's say there was a civilization that evolved, developed intelligent life, and launched a spacecraft. And let's imagine for a minute that they've got some technology we can't fathom. A way to push past the limits of the speed of light, to keep themselves alive while traversing the vast black distance of space. And what if Oumuamua wasn't the first extraterrestrial visitor? What if aliens have already found us, and they've made contact, not once, but several times? Because there are certainly a lot of people who think they've seen them. I was convinced when I was 14. You know, and the thing is, if one actually lands on the White House lawn, like, there will be somebody say, oh no, that's a big Hollywood prop. Some people will never be accepting. I think that the important thing for people to know is that for the most part, the visitors appear not to have done significant harm to individuals, although they certainly have frightened people. If they wanted to take over this planet and enslave us or replace us, they could have done that a very long time ago. Thousands of people claim to have seen UFOs or had alien encounters. Some of those stories can be dismissed outright. They seem too far-fetched, or they end up having perfectly reasonable explanations. But others can't be ignored. They leave people scratching their heads. And some mysteries continue to linger. Like what happened in Roswell, New Mexico, over 70 years ago. That's coming up next on Wild Thing. If you ever happen to be in Boulder, Colorado, and want to do your own solar system walk, check out the Colorado Scale Model Solar System on the University of Colorado Boulder campus. Created by Tom Ayers, Ken Center, Ron Bass, Matt Carter, and Jeff Bennett, the Colorado model is one of only a handful of walkable scale model solar systems in the world that use a true scale. For more information, I've linked to it on social media, at Wild Thing Pod, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And check out our website, wildthingpodcast.com. That's Wild Thing Podcast, all one word. If you're enjoying Wild Thing, please subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to good stories. Also, definitely tell your friends. All of this really helps get the word out about the show and makes another season possible. This podcast is a production of Foxtopus, Inc. Our executive producer is Scott Carney. Editing is by Alicia Lipinski. And the score and sound mixing comes from Louis Weeks. I'm your host and creator, Laura Krantz.